April shows this week, an Athon Books showcase where uh, we partnered with Athon Books, one of the very best publishers in science fiction and fantasy. And we've been featuring some of their authors all week long and trying to show you some of the great work that's coming out of Athon right now by hearing from some of their authors and featuring some audiobook clips from some of their new books. Today's interview is with Matthew P. Gilbert. Matt and I have a great conversation about writing and fantasy, storytelling in general. You're going to love this show. And before we get into the interview with Matt, we're going to play an audiobook excerpt from the first book in his Sins of the Father series. It's called Dead Gods Do. Let's jump into that, and then we'll go straight into the interview with Matt right after that. Thanks for listening. You're a tenacious bastard, Yazid, he said by way of greeting, and extended a dark, calloused hand. Yazid extended his own even darker and larger hand and gripped Michael's firmly. Ilawe teaches us patience through frustration, he said with a smile, pleased with his victory. Michael withdrew his hand with a nod and took up his own parade rest stance. What is it you want, prelate? You are avoiding me. So I am, but only because I have no time. And your wild fantasies take away from more important things. As he scowled at Michael. That much is clear from your dress. What could be more pressing than my fantasy, as you call it? Is not warfare a matter of import to you these days? Aye, warfare is of greatest import. Real warfare. Not this half-baked prophecy of dead gods and emperors walking the earth again. Michael's gaze shifted to the window, his eyes scanning the burning sands as if searching for hidden enemies. You know damned well that the Jacinth issue is at a boiling point. If my father does not act soon... It is a matter of proportion, surely. Proportion? Michael snapped his attention back to Yazid. I'll tell you about proportion. The women are in revolt. My own wife has banned me from our marriage bed as a coward. She'll not have me return while a single Jacinthi dog still rules. Michael pounded his fist against his chest to emphasize his point. And I am a prince. Never mind that the Jacinthi are evil and deserve what they get. What will you do to sway the masses of sex-starved soldiers? He turned away and began pacing, glaring at the floor the walls, his gaze anywhere but on Yazid. I tell you, it's inevitable, and it will be soon. My father knows it, and still he drags his feet. It's madness! Yazid drew in a deep breath and let it out slowly, determined not to be drawn off topic. Michael, you must listen. This is not some fevered zealotry. It is hard fact. These are not religious writings I put before you. They are historical documents. Xanthius himself wrote of this. Ha! <laughs> you interpret them zealously, Michael said with a snort as he continued pacing the cool stone floor. Yazid's heart pounded loud in his ears as he waited, hoping against hope. But it was in vain. Michael stopped pacing, looked him in the eye and declared, this is a fool's errand. Yazid opened his mouth to protest, but Michael stopped him with a raised hand and a face of stone. My decision is made. If you are set to go traipsing off to Prima, chasing myths and legends, most likely to die, then you'll do it on your own, with your own men. Xanthia's soldiers are all needed here. You could spare a single century. I cannot. It would be noticed leaving, and it would raise questions that I cannot address at the moment. But Michael! Enough! Michael shouted, dismissing Azid's attempts to protest with the slash of his hand through the air. Try not to break anyone else's arm on your way out, prelate. With that, Michael turned and left, leaving the door open behind him. Yazid struggled to constrain his anger and failed. He smashed a mailed fist into the bench, splintering the wood. Then, as an afterthought, 
lifted the bench into the air and hurled it against the wall, sending debris flying in all directions. As he stood, chest heaving, tears of frustration welling in his eyes, he heard motion in the doorway behind him. Reaching for his sword out of instinct, he spun to find himself face to face with a second chance. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have my friend Matthew Gilbert on the show with me today. He has a phenomenal new trilogy that's out on Athon Books, and uh, the first book, Dead Gods Do, Mad Gods Muse is the second, and the new book, uh, the finale in the trilogy, War Gods Will, is out everywhere now. You can get into this series and consume the whole thing at once. Uh, welcome to the show, Matt. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you. Man, I'm uh, excited to have you. Uh, Matt, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, my gosh. Uh, I mean, this this kind of goes back to, I mean, when I was a little kid where, you know, I don't know if you have children or not, but children had this I have tendency five. to... Uh, well, then you'll understand exactly what I'm saying about the, the story that never ends, you know, and you continue <laughs> to try to be interested. I was definitely one of those kids, uh, you know, so I suppose about the time I started learning to write at all, you know, I was doing this kind of thing. Nice, nice. Um, did you did you come from a creative family? Was, like, was there a storytelling element that was kind of passed down? Or no, not the, particularly. Were you the freak in the clan? Uh, I, I don't know if I'd be the freak, but uh, I, I would say uh, I am the, the singular person who does uh, any kind of writing. Uh, most of my siblings and I as well had an interest in music, and, you know, we uh, all, all of us were involved with bands at some point, you know, in the past as well. But uh, I'm the only one who's doing a lot of writing. Nice, nice. Uh, were you a big reader as a kid? And, and uh, you told me about the never-ending story, but uh, right. what, what – what kinds of stuff like grabbed your attention and, and sucked you in? <laughs> I read everything, man, everything. I mean, my mom likes to tell the story of, uh, of discovering me reading her copy of the Poseidon adventure when I was in like first grade. <laughs> so, you know, everything. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm always, you know, a sci-fi and fantasy person first and foremost. Uh, and that's, my time being much more limited in that I too have five children. Uh, that's that's pretty much all I read at this point. Nice. Do you remember as a kid what that first book or series or author that uh, that kind of cracked the code for you? Like uh, I, I remember reading um, "Have Space Suit Will Travel" and mm -hmm. it just like cracked my head wide open. And uh, you know, now you go back and, and read stuff, and you're like, "Ah, oh, it was it was okay," but but at the time, it just like lit me on fire you know do you have an experience like that uh yeah that's probably got to be Hall and ellison man uh you know his his stuff like really blew me away you know we have like i have no mouth and i'm a scream stories like that you know i mean yeah and and ellison himself being such a larger than life and wild character man you know so uh he's 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 my number one guy yeah when when we lost him last year that was a uh it was a darker place with his yeah, past yeah it's a uh, a sucking hole left where Harlan was crazy. So um, did, did you show any kind of aptitude for writing in school? Did you ever have a teacher or somebody that was like, you know, Matt, you, you might have something here. Very much so. Uh, I, I did a lot of stuff, but it was, it was the kind of thing that uh, it was more, you know, a dilettante kind of thing. Uh, uh, oh, I would write a story here or I would start, I, maybe I'll write a book here, that kind of thing. I was always very much encouraged by my teachers uh, I had a lot of other things going on, and I never really took it seriously until, you know, much more, much further into my adult life. Uh, I, you know, I wanted to be in a band, uh, so we were doing band stuff, writing songs, things like that. Um, and then I also did a lot of stuff with computers, so uh, that was uh, that was taking up most of my time when I was much younger. You know, um, I, I'm always interested in the, the cross-section of creative pursuits and, and how one informs the other or one can be a building block to another. Um, do you feel like your your time as a musician and, and pursuing that stuff has uh, informed the stuff that you do or um, it, it, has it kind of energized you to be at the place where you are now? 
it certainly can. Um, I uh, I would say probably listen to other people's music would have would have made more of a difference in my writing, and that you know you get a lot of ideas from that kind of stuff. Um, as far as any, I think kind of cross disciplinary, if you're going to use that term, uh, is going to be helpful. But I also think that there's a downside of, you know, you're only going to spend so much time at one thing. Uh, it's, it's very easy to be distracted from trying to, to master something or to really put, you know, enough labor into something to come out with a, a finished product if, if you just had to dabble in everything. So at some point you had to choose your battles. Right. So at, at what point did, did you shift gears and, and realize that, uh, uh, that that music was was not going to be your main pursuit and and switch to writing or was it was it a decision or did did one did did writing just kind of pick up and and eventually it's just replaced well that that didn't really happen exactly that way uh at some point i realized that um i had i was a terribly weak person and had a fondness for uh you know luxuries like food and shelter so <laughs> so the music thing had to be set by the wayside and also the writing had to be set by the wayside so uh i did a stint in the military in the navy uh and i eventually ended up as a uh professional video game programmer and so most of my life has been spent working in silicon valley and uh making video games or more recently now do uh educational software uh and Basically, the writing came in, oh, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago. I got started just trying to to find some creative outlet. Programming is creative, but professional programming often is not because you're you're doing work that's made to order. Uh, so th- there had to be something. So it started to be, you know, this is my this is my free time kind of thing. Uh, I'll create something and, you know, perhaps I'll never get paid for it. That's not really the point of it. The point is to do the creating. Uh, so essentially cribbing time here and there uh, after finishing the first book, I realized, you know, this could. I, I could I could do this more, and and I began to take it more seriously. Then I have a feeling that you and I are, are pretty close in age. Um, I was born in the early seventies, and uh, late sixties for me. Okay, all right. So we're 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 close yes. in there. And I, you know, as a kid in the late seventies, early eighties, when the kind of the home computer revolution was happening, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I was that kid that you know would anytime I could get my hands on a computer and. Uh, you know, learning to to write programs basic and then, you know, uh, assembler. And, you know, there there was such a time of discovery then and creativity stuff was going on. Uh, and a lot of those early games were, were based around, um, you know, fantasy stories or role-playing games. Yes, and that they sort were. Of thing. And there, there's always been, uh, to me, a close kinship between those early computing days and fantasy literature and sci-fi um, as someone who who went through that as well, and and really is still there, um, do you feel like that time uh, was a, a more creative time? And I, I know things have really become distilled. And uh, you know, my kids look at computers as just appliances. You know, it's a <clears throat> laptop is a toaster. You know, to them, it's not a thing of discovery like it was for me. Yeah. What do you think about that time and coming through that? No, I absolutely agree because um, I, I I think. Among other things, there was a there was a much stronger kind of uh, uh, technical hobbyist community at the time. Uh, you don't see uh, like there were magazines on the stand like Compute and stuff where uh, you know there were hobbyist programmers and stuff like that, and you don't see that a lot anymore. Uh, to some degree, the internet has made that go away. I mean, they made magazines go away, right? Um, but uh, systems are much more complicated, uh, and people are greatly discouraged from trying to get down to the metal and program stuff in assembly, for example. They don't really need to anyway. I mean, you know, for for most people's purposes, things like C sharp are, uh, you know, they're they're performant enough that uh, they, you know, that will do for them. They can uh, they can produce plenty of stuff in that. Whereas, you know, back in the day, if I wanted to sort in any time less than like. 30 seconds i had to learn assembly so i could do sorting with it you know that kind of thing um it was a much more creative time in terms of the products that were being made too uh the the industry itself has moved on and uh it's 
It, the, the environment is very controlled. Uh, it's no longer being driven by the developers themselves. It's uh, it's being driven by people who officially build themselves as game designers and are are basically giving work orders to the art teams or to the programming teams rather than uh, those teams actually doing the development themselves. When when I started the industry in '93, we were we were making all the decisions, and now uh, you don't you don't really make any. That's somebody else's. Right. I uh, I interviewed Richard Garriott at DragonCon a couple of years mm-hmm. ago. Uh, you know the the creator of oh, the Ultima series. I know him well. And, <laughs> and I, I I don't know him personally, but I know the name well. Yeah, yes. and I you know I just kind of sat there and like gushing over you, like you have no idea what you know what you've done, you know, in my life, and it's uh it, it, you know it's kind of embarrassing, but uh, I you know, I look <laughs> I I closely tie that that time and period with with a lot of stuff's going on in literature now and um. I think that's a great thing. Anyway, side tangent over. Um, <laughs> what to, what brought you back to writing, and what kind of stories did you start writing that that maybe told you, okay, you know, maybe this is more than just um, you know passing fancy. Maybe maybe I can get like all the way through and and write a story that is complete. I, what eventually motivated me to actually put pen to paper uh, was I wasn't finding the sort of thing that I wanted to read. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I was interested in, I don't know, you know, kind of old school stuff, you know, Faffer and the Gray Mouse or Elric, uh, Black Company, those kinds of stuff, right? You know, the stuff that, you know, when we were kids was the cool stuff, right? Uh, and that kind of went out of favor, uh, and, and I could, but I won't make some political comments there, uh, <laughs> because I see no reason to, to make enemies, but, uh, the, the truth of the matter was I wasn't finding what I wanted. And so I thought, well, I will make these things for myself. I mean, I can, I can entertain myself to a certain degree by writing this kind of thing. And. A lot of great writing has come out of you know seeing a need in the market and uh, and deciding to fill that. Mm-hmm. Where did where did this this new trilogy that you published uh, where did it where did it come from? Where did Dead Gods do? Uh, and and Gods is is an interesting spelling there, so you kind of break that down for people. But right. what was the genesis of this story? Uh, this this entire. Like book series, etc., is it's it's the backstory for a D and D campaign that we ran. Oh, I don't know, ten or fifteen years ago. Uh, that we called our um, we called our uh, uh, the man who would be king campaign, and uh, this this is actually backstory for that campaign. Uh, all the all the kind of history that the the players were dealing with in the. Uh, uh, in the actual game, this, you know, this was like, you know, 10, 20 years before then. Nice. Uh, so how long have you been playing D and D? Oh, good Lord. Uh, 40 years, something like that. <laughs> nice. Nice. Uh, which, which has its own, uh, history of feeding writers. You know, there, Absolutely. This, this cooperative storytelling and, and learning to, uh, make story on the fly uh you know there are very few things in this world that uh can be as educational for writers as as playing a role-playing game very much so as as long as they understand you know writing is is a different medium and you know the same things don't work correctly because a lot of times you you see guys who come from that and they're basically it's like a transcript of a game and it's like you know (laughs) that's not that's not the same, you know, you need to take the cool parts from the game and then you need to put them together (laughs) in the way that would be for a good novel, you know? Right. Right. Well, lit RPG is doing a Mm -hmm. little bit of that now where it's, it's kind of, it's showing the skeleton more. Um, but man, I, have got, uh, I got mad props for, for guys who can do that, that, uh, because yeah, you're right. It's, it's like dreaming up a a, a great story in Spanish, but then you've got to figure out how to bring that to an English audience, you know? And right. Uh, it's it's some translation there that needs to happen, but uh, uh, but so so this is a backstory for a campaign. W- when did you start thinking of this as a book? Uh, basically after we were no longer playing that campaign, and you know I had to have something to fill my time. I suppose uh, I had copious notes because I'm basically you know when you're running a when you're running a D and D game, you're you're doing a lot of backfill, right? 
So as things are occurring to you, you're you're kind of implementing them in game, and you know then you kind of write notes down of okay, I decided this, you know, this character has this history, you know, the PCs talk with him about it, so remember that for future kinds of things, that kind of stuff. Uh, so uh, once we once we weren't playing anymore, and I had time, and again looking for a creative outlet, that's you know you you take all that stuff that you did, and you're like this uh, this is a good story in and of itself. So tell us about the world that this uh, this takes place in. Uh, I have a, a a kind of interesting kind of take on the world. Uh, I kind of um, I, I envision the world as it's a modern world, except that uh, technological development was, was retarded by the presence of magic. So uh, I have very advanced social systems in a lot of places, uh, but with primitive technology. Because a lot of our technology in the real world is developed because we're looking for more efficient means to kill one another, and they are financed <laughs> by kings. Okay, right. uh, sadly well, the, but true. Given that the king can finance sorcerers, uh, there there weren't guys out there inventing gunpowder and stuff because the sorcerer can already make things blow up with a fireball, uh, and so. Uh, that's that's sort of a little bit of the notion is that uh, more socially advanced, more Renaissance level cultures uh, with uh, but but with technology that would be uh, a little earlier than Renaissance, depending on the depending on the culture. Uh, and also the world itself is uh, is pretty variegated. There are there are very different cultures uh, in very different places and they don't all get along. And so – which is kind of the gas behind this story here. Uh, I have two very different cultures, one that is a uh, a warrior-based culture, uh, extremely religious, and they have no concept of laws. They think the idea of laws is stupid, uh, and they, they basically just have social mores. Uh, and uh, another culture that has – well, there's pretty much a law for everything, but we don't really pay attention to them because we're corrupt as hell. And so you can imagine how uh, a collision between those two cultures would go. This has to be fun to uh, not only just the the technology that you're talking about, but to see how societies would change uh, when when we're not striving toward solving a problem, and you don't have to do that because you have magic, right. or uh, you know, and and war, like you said, a, a huge deciding factor. Um, but you know, there there are other technological advances that happen because we're we're trying to feed people or we're trying to, um, uh, you know, uh, electricity right. and things like that. You know, so seeing how how societies break down uh, or advance in different ways, that has to be a lot of fun to play with. Yes, and, and I have different cultures also have different kind of technological levels. For example, my my corrupt culture that I was telling you about, the Nelotians, uh, their technology is, is actually pretty decent. It's probably approaching, you know, uh, early – Late nineteenth, early twenty, early twentieth century technology there, but they they don't they don't have guns, but you know they have things like pregnancy tests, and they have a meld of uh, technology and magic that they work with and stuff. Uh, and kind of like in any other society, there are there are the the technicians and the sorcerers who work with it, and everybody else who just sort of takes advantage of it. Uh, so those sorts of things are kind of treated like, uh, most people would treat their car today. You know, I don't know. I put my key in it. I drive it. It goes when it stops. I have to take it to somebody <laughs> to fix it. Right? right. Well, it's not like there's any car out today that you could just pull over on the side of the road and adjust a carburetor. Right. You know, exactly. It's, it's, yeah. It, there's, th there's some magic going on there under the hood. And we to to, to a large it. degree. Yes. I mean, you know, I've, I've given up trying to do that stuff again, you know, and, and I'm a very technical person. I used to enjoy working on cars. Uh, but it's just – it's too complicated. You have to have too many tools. You have to know too many things, and it's like – it's easier to have somebody else maintain it at this point. <laughs> right. I, my daughter bought a new car the other day, and I lifted the hood, and I said, well, I mean, yep, there's – Where's there's an the engine? engine? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess it's that box down there. I don't uh, – I don't – I don't – I don't understand this, how they work. This is anymore. a center mount engine. It's it's under the back seat. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So so we've got kind of how the world is structured now. Um, you know, every great story centers around a protagonist or a series of them that we can then care about in this world that you've that you've created. Who do we meet, and uh, and what's the uh, 
kind of what's the conflict that we're looking at here in the book? Uh, this is I have I have a kind of a strange setup here. So uh, I have a way back a long time ago and a now and way back a long time ago, basically a thousand years in the past, there was a there was a great war and the war basically centered around. Uh, a certain group of sorcerers acquiring secrets made that was not meant to know. And they, uh, they figured out how to basically cripple a God and steal his power. And things went, things went very badly. And it, and it, it instantly created a worldwide war. And uh, the guys fought each other almost to the brink of extinction before sorting this out. Um, As part of the resolution to this, uh, the, the God that they had chosen as their victim essentially swore vengeance on their children far down the line. Uh, and so he promised them in a thousand years, well, things were going to get real bad. Uh, he promised them a world of ash in a thousand years, specifically after they were all dead and, and nobody remembered. Uh, so then we move forward into the story and we have uh, the, the cultures that were involved have indeed all forgotten that uh, oh the 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 dead god said he was going to come back and and kill us all and and destroy the world. Uh, there are a few scholarly like individuals who have preserved this knowledge, but basically people are kind of like they would be today. You know, it's like well wait you know there's a there's the prophecy of you know whatever right there whatever you know we 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 have more important things to do. So um so we start out with um. Uh, focus on uh, a guy who's called a prelate, and he is from the he's from this warrior culture, the the Xanthians, and he is trying to convince his prince that this is something important. And the prince basically does not care because he says, "I have other problems. Uh, we we have war things to deal with. Uh, we we can't fool with this right now." Uh, and so he's essentially turned away, but he speaks with the other prince, the younger prince, and, and he agrees to give him a vessel and, and some men to go and investigate this prophecy. Um, and in, in order to do that, what he's going to do is he's going to go to this old culture that they've been split from for a long time and hope to find some allies there to try and sort this out. But they have no idea if if it's going to be, well, we have to kill one another or if, if they will be friendly. So they, they go on this exploration mission. Uh, and from there, the story, then, uh, there are, there are characters in the other culture. Uh, there are several characters in there, uh, who they all play their parts. I don't want, I don't want to spend too much time going into it, but, uh, we, we get to learn about a few characters in there. There's Aul, who is a physician in, in Nilos and, uh, his problem, he has problems with his mother disapproving of his marriage, et cetera. Uh, they have no idea of the prophecy that's going on. They have no idea that a group of their ancient enemies are on their way to try and deal with this ancient prophecy kind of thing. So, um, and, and the book basically takes shape from there, uh, with the, the arrival of the Xanthians creating a a rather tremendous political situation, uh, in, in Nilos when they arrive. And, and then there are a number of repercussions because of that. Matt, uh, some people don't, don't understand fantasy, I think. I think some people that say they're not fans of fantasy don't understand um, kind of the the implications of things that you get to play out mm-hmm. with in, in fantasy literature. What What is it about fantasy um, that's so important to you? What, what do you think we get to do with fantasy that maybe you can't do uh, in any other genre? I think that – I think it kind of is comparable – but different from science fiction. In science fiction, a lot of the stories end up being, well, you know, how does uh, how does culture react to some invention? Okay, uh, and I think conversely, but similarly, fantasy lets us look at how people react. Uh, it lets us study moral issues uh, with the notion of, well, what if it were possible? to read people's minds what if it were possible to compel people to do things or you know we had these you know fears that you know dragons would attack or you know ancient prophecies could come real uh you know how will people behave in those sorts of things uh how would our morals change uh who would we think are the good guys and the bad guys if uh if our world were tremendously different than it is now right it it's become popular 
uh, in the last few years in, in certain circles to uh, to pick apart certain things. And I, I look at Tolkien for an example, um, and uh, you know people trying to devise some sort of uh, explanation for why he wrote the stories he did, and and you know was the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit and the Silmarillion were they commentary on on the world he was living in at the time? And, and I think mm-hmm. in certain aspects we have to say yes. I mean, when he's in the in the trenches in World War One, uh, you know that that probably shapes the way you think about war and things like that. Uh, sure. But then when you're talking about people groups and all that, and you know we're certain we're certain. Uh, you know, uh, races and characters in his book were they analogs of, of people in the real world, and I think he, he, it becomes very dangerous uh, there to, especially to someone who's not here to defend himself anymore, but to start applying applying certain um, you know scholarship to a work that that maybe just wasn't there in the beginning, and it just becomes futile. What do you think uh, about d- does fantasy need to reflect the world around us? Uh, and should we just enjoy a great story? I uh, well, uh, let me let me step that's, back a bit here. That's a multi-pronged wanna, question. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I, I want to comment that uh, in in general, I consider literary analysis and wine tasting and the fine art of bullshitting <laughs> to all be synonymous. Um, it's a yeah, lot of navel gazing. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, you know, because I used to get A's in college in my English class by co- just completely manufacturing 100% bullshit in the same right. way that, as, as I said, you know, I know nothing about wine, but oh my goodness, I can taste all the nutty oakiness and stuff, right? You know, I I, I, I do know about wine, but you, you you understand my point, right? And And so, you know, this notion that, you know, well, we're going to deconstruct this stuff, I, I, I think very poorly of it because I think that there's there, there's no rigor to it. It's not like a science or anything. I can justify any point that I want to make uh, by by picking and choosing, you know, uh, by cherry picking different things. So I don't have a lot of thought for that in the first place. Now, as for people who feel that there should be some, you know, social commentary, well, uh, if the author wants to. <laughs> is is how I would is how I would look at it, sure. But I don't think you can even really. I don't think you can extrapolate that to the real world because again, you're dealing with cultures that are not part of the real world and 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 are often, in fact, designed specifically so that they have something very different and that they probably would behave, think, and react very differently from the real world. Uh, I, I, I think that while we can do it as, you know, kind of analysis of the, the human spirit in general, uh, and we can analyze things like good and evil a little bit, I don't think there's any social responsibility. And I object to the notion that, you know, a, a fantasy story would have anything that it must do, that it must represent someone, you know, that's like, that's like saying, well, the results of a scientific experiment must be something. It's like, no, they, they will be what they are. Right, right. Or it's not a legitimate science experiment. Correct. At that and, point. And, and it is not a legitimate expression of art if someone has placed prior constraints on, on how it can be or the story, the story that can be told. Exactly. That was exactly the answer I was hoping for from you. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, the name of the series, uh, the, the, the new series that, that you just wrapped with book three is called sins of the fathers book yes. one through three. And that's obviously an allusion to the prior curse that has now Correct. reached its payday. Correct. Um, it, were there any surprises in writing this series that you stumbled on that maybe the story went in a different way than you, than, than you first, uh, you know, thought about, you know, there's this ancient curse. It's, mm-hmm. it's, you know, payday is coming due with a generation that has forgotten all about it. And then you, you jump in with these characters and put them, you know, under these constraints. Did the story go anywhere that, that surprised you along the way? In, uh, in programming, we call it emergent properties, right? Uh, so, yes, I, I want, always. Uh, I mean, essentially, uh, my, my view on writing would be I create, uh, I, to a certain extent, it's going to be kind of like creating a D and D game, right? I create a situation, I create characters, but then much of my task as a writer is then to to work out how the characters will try to resolve the situation based on the, what I know about them as the characters, right? You know, I mean, I'm basically running a small AI simulation of them as I try to work out what they're going to do. So they quite often 
surprise me. Uh, I even ran into situ ran into excuse me. I even ran into situations where uh, I had a character who was supposed to be the villain, and said character did not wish to be the villain, and I ended up splitting that character into two characters, um, such that I still had a villain, but uh, this character, while many people find her very obnoxious, uh, was was not going to accept being the villain. She she was happy to be dumb. She was happy to be annoying. She was happy to be perverse, but but not ruthless, cruel, and evil. I, lo- I, I love that, how I, when a character just comes alive on the page mm-hmm. and she's like, nope, that's not who I am. And, and, and then you're like, well, crap, what's this going to do to the rest of the story? Yes, and, and sometimes you're going to have to figure it out. Sometimes the end of your story isn't isn't what you thought it was because the characters how they would behave take things in a different direction you know and you can veto that but then it it doesn't necessarily ring true anymore and that's probably the most important thing to me is do do, do what the characters are does what the characters are doing seem like what they would do and i get a lot of good compliments on that well, with the the new book War God's Will, which is out now uh, in in, uh, in paperback and Kindle and audiobook edition, all of these are available in phenomenal audiobook editions. Um, with that wraps the uh, Sins of the Fathers uh, series, but I have a feeling that there's more to this world. Uh, there, there is tremendously more. Uh, there is, uh, I I do have plans for. Uh, three books that follow, and also I have plans to write uh, the the history, uh, the the thousand years in the past of uh, where they actually were meddling with secrets man was not meant to know, and where they created a lot of the situations that are now. Uh, that being said, one must find the time, and you know <laughs> the the series kind of has to find a a home for itself, and uh, you know so so those projects will be taken up assuming it seems that there would be a demand for them yeah well uh, guys uh, fantasy fans out there uh historical fiction fans there's this this book series uh i i think will um uh will appeal to a to a wide swath of readers out there this is uh one of the best fantasy series that i've picked up in quite a while and i, I really love it matt I appreciate um, that. Thank yeah, you very much. You're you're welcome. We're going to try to get as many people to go pick up their copy. There are links to all three in the show notes of this episode. Uh, Matt, if people are just learning about you and just discovering you, is there a place where they can find you online to dig into all that you do and connect with you? Uh, probably the place where I'm most active is on Facebook. Uh, okay. it's, it's real simple. It's Matt Gilbert writer. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, uh, I'm easy to find, you know. Awesome. Uh, I have a site called uh, www.nilos.com. I'm not as active there. Uh, and I used to post on Twitter, uh, but not so much anymore. Uh, I, I'm, my handle is Amrath of Nilos, if anybody cares. But the truth of the matter is I'm not there very often. Facebook is where I am more than anything else. It's just easier for me, and that's where I'll post my stupid little uh, shareables from uh, the Zombie Survival uh, Society and stuff like that. So, Yeah, Twitter can be a dumpster fire. Uh, I have to take in little doses. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I, you well, know, or else I'll be getting enforced vacations from there anyway. So, <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Well, Matt, this has been so much fun hanging out, talking books. Uh, we're going to send everybody to pick up their copies of the Sins of the Father series. Uh, there's links to to all of that in the show notes as well as your Facebook uh, profile. And uh, thanks so much for taking time to come on the show. Absolutely, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. <laughs>